Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Andrew, thanks for taking some time to join me on the program today. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Yeah, I think as we are just explaining and we're talking about off air, you are going to bring so many insights to this podcast that we've actually never covered before. So ground that is new to many of our investors and indeed myself, this is the sector in which you operate and you've been so successful in is a sector that, that I don't have an exposure to. And it's kind of this amazing world. I've always thought of property from the demand side, not never have I thought about it from the financing of the supply side. So this is a really interesting conversation. But what I love to do at the start of the conversation is hear more about you and your journey, because I feel like that's going to set set us up for the the, the business that you've built and the way you think about investing and, and building a portfolio and all of that. So take us back to the younger Andrew. Where did you grow up? Did you have any mentors around money? Anything that you can you can share with us would be great. Sure, thanks. It's it's really my pleasure to to be here. So uh, I grew up. I was educated uh, in uh, Melbourne. I studied at Monash University, and in fact, uh, my first job was being an auditor in uh, one of the major accounting firms when I when I graduated, which is what you did back in in 1985 when I first started in in my career. Uh, it actually was interesting because I, did, I actually didn't last very long in that particular role. And I discovered after about four months that being an auditor was probably not my, long, my long-term passion, but it coincided with the time that banks had deregulated in Australia. And I really saw an opportunity to uh, join one of the uh, over, overseas banks who had been given a, a banking license at, at that particular time and, and really uh, join them. I, I grew up in a family where uh, my father was self-employed. He, he was a property developer. So, you know, in my younger years, I was uh, always out on, you know, building sites and, and, and jobs, as he used to call it, looking at, you know, various developments that he was undertaking. You know, he was uh, a relatively uh, large developer for uh, his, his time. And, and I guess one of the things that he taught me at a, at a very young age, I can still hear his words today, it was really around, you know, if you work on little things, it really translates into little money. If you work on big things, it translates into uh, uh, bigger money. And so uh, it probably took me a while to fully appreciate exactly what those um, words of advice meant. But, but I do know that today when I work on a small transactions, in my world, that can be a $10 million transaction versus a large transaction of $300 million, it's the same time and effort, but clearly uh, the larger transactions in absolute dollars anyway yield, you know, much, much larger results. Um, in, ter- in terms of, you know, mentors, you know, when I reflect on my career over um, the last, uh, dare I say, 35 years, you know, I, I feel that, uh, you know, there's been lots of mentors actually a- along the way. And, and I think you learn different things from, from different people. And I can certainly, you know, think of uh, people who I met that um, imparted very worldly thoughts with me about how to energise, how to create value. But I'd also say I met a lot of people in my journey that I observed that I thought, actually, I can learn about how not to handle a situation or, or manage a situation. I would never manage in the way that they're managing. And so I, I think you can just generally learn a lot from just observing other people and what resonates with you and um, you know, what also doesn't, doesn't resonate with you along, along the way. What, yeah, sorry, Andrew, me, can, I, can I jump in just a question yeah. there? Why do you yeah. think you didn't last in auditing? This is a circling back a bit. 
Yeah, you know, it's, um, you know, for me, and it, 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 this is only my experience, so I'm not saying clearly it's a very deep and well-respected profession. And, and I think it's about personality types. But for me personally, what I found about being an auditor was that it was a very look back profession and role. So, you know, the work and, uh, you know, the business creativity had already been done. And my role was really checking the, the balances of historical events. And I, from a very early age, wanted to make sure that I was in the, you know, the front seat mm -hmm. of transactions and creating the future, not the person really checking, you know, the past and what had occurred in, in the past. And so, you know, I, I realised that pretty, pretty early on. It was actually a very large decision to, to leave one of those firms. You know, probably the analogy I can give mm -hmm. is it's the same as somebody today saying, look, I don't really want to pursue a career. What, what I'd rather do is, uh, you know, look to do a tech startup or something like that, that you'd say, hey, that person's really going out on the, on the risk curve. And in my, in, in my early days, you know, it was really the same. You know, the, the really well-worn path was to do a commerce degree, which I did, join an accounting firm, then perhaps either become a partner in the firm or, you know, look to join one of the clients and in industry. So to break away literally in about the fourth month of my role within the firm and join, you know, what was seen to be a merchant bank of its day was really seen as someone going out on the, on, on the risk curve. And I remember, you know, a number of people counselling me about it. My sure this is, you know, exactly the right decision for where I'm at in life. And, you know, it's so early on and, uh, and just feeling really convinced it was the right decision for me. Mm. So, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I was interested in that point because of where you took it next. So, um, can you ex explain what, I guess, transpired in your life and your professional life up until, say, the GFC, which is around that 2008, 2009 mark, which we'll get to in a moment, but what kind of took you down the path to that point? So, it's probably best just to to answer that, to break it down into different phases of my, my working career. And, you know, the 1980s, I can, I can really only talk about it from really the half, halfway point of that particular decade, 1985 and beyond, was really an era where um, the Australian government had deregulated the bank financial system. So it went from a handful of Australian licensed banks to something like 104 banking licenses issued in the country. And of those, you know, they were mainly overseas banks who came to Australia. They were, you know, heavily looking for staff. Accounting firms was a, a great place to, to really, you know, pick off high calibre individuals who were prepared to, to really get involved in a brand new industry that was relatively unheard of in, in Australia in, in its time. And so what you can imagine, you know, going from a handful of banks to over a hundred um, licensed financial institutions, that this led to a very debt fueled era in, in Australia. So you had a lot of uh, banks, a lot of uh, advancing against property, really fueling the property market, a lot of asset inflation. Uh, you then had the uh, equity market correction of 1987. Uh, it, it didn't particularly affect the property market. In fact, I'd say the reverse. If anything, it fueled the property market even further as people shifted money out of equities and into property uh, at, a, at its time. So property really had a very strong you know, three or four years, but coincided with quite a strong rise in interest rates as well. So by the time you got to 1991, and as the then, uh, you know, Treasurer said, you know, uh, about the, the recession that we all had to have in 1991, it really ended up in, in, in the debt bubble being burst and a very serious correction right across the board, um, including property markets as well. And so that was really the start of a very down period in, in, in Australian property markets. And at that time, I was hired by 
a Australian owned, federally owned government financier in, in the role of asset management, which is really a, a nice way of um, putting the term as to uh, asset workouts, which is really looking at, you know, loans that were really struggling to be able to be repaid. And I was, you know, a, a senior person working with the Australian government, really looking to try and keep borrowers um, alive and healthy and well in, in the best possible way that we could. But it was, it was very challenging times. It was very dominated by, you know, groups of banks who formed syndicates with each other. And, you know, it was really about, you know, trying to work through that particular period. So for me, that was invaluable experience. And, you know, what I mostly learned from that particular experience was just how much money can be made by investing at the bottom of a cycle when things are looking at the darkest of times. And, uh, and, and just, you know, I observed that just the sheer quantum of profits and upside that the people had made over, over that period of time. And really, I hadn't really seen those events reappear until 2008. Mm. So did the, in between that though, did the, the period of early 2000s impact the property market insofar as, you know, the, the equity crash and the dot-com bust, did that ripple into debt markets or not really? Uh, I, I would say not, not really. And, uh, you know, I think that from the period of 1991 really to um, the late 90s was, was, was this really grindy period of time where the cycle moved a lot slower and things took a lot longer, you know, for transactions to actually occur. By the time, you know, we then headed into the period of 2000 and beyond, it was very much a equity market driven uh, cycle. And so less, less a bit about debt through that particular period of time. But it was really when the equity markets really started gaining quite significant momentum. And, you know, property does feed off the equity markets. You know, people tend to make a lot of money out of the equity markets. They then like to take it out of the equity markets because rightly they're looking for diversification. And you tend to find, you know, people then take their profits and, you know, start to spread it into, you know, property related assets. So I think, I think property was a great beneficiary of, you know, the equity the start of that equity boom that it occurred in, in 2000s. But of course, you know, that picture started to look quite different in 2008. So this is around the time you co-founded Qualitas, which is the business that you now run and it's wildly successful. I imagine that that period of time, 2008, 2009, even coming off the top of 2007, would have been very, very... I guess, unique as you look back at it. We've just heard about these things out of these debt instruments out of the USA that are causing havoc. Rating, ratings agencies are in the limelight. Uh, property prices would probably be a big unknown for a lot of investors. And yet here you are thinking of setting up a commercial real estate debt-focused business. Talk us through that time and what the, the opportunity that you saw. Yeah, so, you know, firstly, I'd say, uh, you know, two, 2008, uh, just, you know, the headline is, it was a very different environment to not 1991. And, and I already had that 91 benchmark in place, experience of, you know, what a very significant recession felt like. And you could tell relatively early on the 2008 felt very different to 1991. And, and the main point of difference is in 1991, the market had been drained of liquidity. So, the, so when you really think about it, 1991 was a period where superannuation funds had only really just got going in Australia, but they were pretty much in their infancy and weren't considered a significant source of capital, certainly not in the markets of property and, and private credit. And the banks themselves were in significant financial difficulties. And most of the private investors, so 
let's call them the high net worth families, were they themselves, you know, struggling under the weight of debt that they had taken on from these banks who, as I said a second ago, you know, they themselves were, you know, experiencing fi financial difficulties. And so a lot of things were very cheap in 1991. And you would look at them and say, that's incredible value. How do I access that opportunity? And accessing was, diff was difficult because banks weren't really lending money and there was you know, limited, limited sources of equity around. Fast forward to 2008, it was a very different environment because in 2008, people were relatively cashed up. You know, the, you know, firstly, the high net worth investors had significant capital sitting on the sidelines. You know, if you recall, everybody had pretty much gone to cash didn't particularly want to deploy it, but people sitting on large quantums of cash. The super funds, you know, had really gained very significant momentum. And so what you did know is that the liquidity was available to really meet, you know, very, very strong and compelling investments. And, and I think that, you know, for a lot of people who were hoping for absolute bargains to come out of 2008, and I'm more focused now on the property market than, say, the equity market. But for people looking for absolute bargains, uh, you know, I, I think they were fewer and harder to achieve relative to, you know, what, what the previous cycle had shown. But not, notwithstanding that, I do think that, you know, periods of time like 2008 definitely opened up the opportunity to, to make investment. I, I had personally felt this was the perfect time to start up a firm such as Qualitas. You know, I was, I was very conscious of the fact that private credit uh, didn't really uh, substantially exist in Australia, unlike other, other places in the world. You know, I, the story of the banks winding back, which I'd be happy, you know, to, to further explain, but the story Please. of the banks, you know, winding back and, those opportunities, uh, you know, I felt had a very long, long way to go and, and is still continuing to play out, you know, to, to this day. And, you know, if, if there's one takeaway message from 2008 for me, it's really that when you look at property and you look at the values, it's really a function of what you think are the cash flows that get derived from property over long periods of time. And so, and that in property terms, that's called the discount rate that one applies to, you know, the value of those cash flows. And, and I think when you go through a crisis, people start to become quite irrational in respect of what those discount rates are. So all, all of a sudden you can start to purchase property based on discount rates where you're getting a premium to what you would normally get in, in, more, uh, in more normal and more certain times. And so, I had felt 2008 was actually the perfect time. Again, I had, you know, good friends and uh, people in my in my ear saying, Andrew, you sure you want to start an investment firm in the middle of 2008? Sort of reminded me of uh, leaving the accounting firm to go into banking, you know, earlier in my career and people really testing judgment. But, but having sort of gone through the 91 experience, I felt it was an excellent time. And in one's working career, I don't think you experience a crisis, thankfully, too often. Um, and I've sort of felt 2008 could potentially be, in my career, the last one, or maybe the second last one. And it, whichever way, I really felt I needed to take advantage of it. And so I saw that as an opportunity more than I saw it as a risk. So how about then, can you, can you explain exactly, just in really simple terms, what you what value like how you create value at qualitas and then some of the the hurdles or challenges you had at that time because i imagine that at that time if you're trying to finance things it may have been difficult for you to get that capital to finance transactions or have i missed the boat there miss mark no 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 not at all i i i think that um you know, but maybe first I should explain what we do at Qualitas. Would that be yeah, a for good sure. start? So two, two thirds of our business is focused on what we call private credit. And basically private, 
credit is us. Uh, it's a fancy name for something that's really simple, which is we're providing loans to borrowers using equity capital sources. So effectively we run funds, investors put equity capital into our funds. We take the money that we've raised in our funds and then we provide loans secured by mortgages to, to borrowers. And typically that's that's called private private credit. And we were certainly back in 2008 when we first started, you know, we, we were providing loans to borrowers that really normally would have been under the domain of the banks, but because of, you know, some level of uh, liquidity shortfall, predominantly driven by the banks reducing their, you know, their lending in, in the marketplace, you know, we were filling, we were filling the gaps and we were earning, you know, relatively um, high rates of return. And the, the way, the best way to think about it is that, you know, in, in normal markets, everything works on a, you know, a, a, a relationship between risk and return. But there are periods of time due to illiquidity where you're able to get a premium of return relative to, to risk. And, and that premium is driven by the lack of supply of capital. And so we were really taking advantage of those dislocations that were occurring in, in the market. We were providing you know, first mortgage loans to, uh, to borrowers at you know, certainly well above bank interest rates. Uh, and you know, our private investors who were really you know, uh, mainly family offices when we first started were earning exceptional rates of return. So, so that was really the genesis of you know, those types of deals. You're, you're right, you're definitely right when you say that one of the biggest challenges for us at the time was, uh, finding, was finding the appropriate capital. And in part in Australia, that was because it was not a well understood asset class, you know, people generally thought, but if you needed a loan, don't you just go to the banks? And if you can't get a loan from the banks, doesn't that mean that you're a, a dodgy borrower? So you're ending up with some, you know, tier, tier two backyard lender who's prepared to give you a loan. And, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. You know, it's, it's really more about, you know, the commercial real estate debt market, you know, today is a $380 billion market. And the banks supply about 93% of the total capital. So there is a shortfall of capital and, you know, that capital has to be met. And so groups like ours, you know, fill that gap with, you know, exceedingly good borrowers uh, who pay for, you know, flexibility and, uh, and, and they pay for timeliness and, and therefore it enables our investors to earn you know very solid rates of return but but it really is about filling a gap of capital and being paid a premium in return for filling for filling the gap and i and i think owen it just took us time to educate the market that you know this opportunity exists you know now it's getting to be better understood but wind back to 2008 it, it was not a well understood opportunity at that point in time I think I'm beginning to understand um, where to see how that opportunity is transpiring today, even with banks uh, and the way we've seen things like the Royal Commission and the banks and the decisions that they've had to make around lending and responsible lending, just in the pro- like in the domestic kind of property market, but or residential, I should say. But um, I'm interested to know because when I was looking at the history of Qualitas, um, it's clear that you guys have grown very quickly, and as a small business owner, I'm keen to understand what, what you believe now looking back from that early period from 2008 onwards, what enabled you to be a success? Was it that, that big macro tailwind that just this demand was just coming out of nowhere? Or were there some things that you were doing so different and changing the landscape for construction companies and, and, and customers or clients, if you like? It's, it's an interesting observation you make because um, I guess, you know, it always looks different from the outside looking in. But I, I actually don't think we did grow all that fast. And in fact, with the benefit of a hindsight, I think we could have grown 
a lot faster than we we actually did. I, I feel mm. we we took a narrow focus and we stayed very very disciplined. Uh, you know, it's a bit like you know we defined a lane that we want to play in and we stayed within our lane. And I, I think Qualitas was shown opportunities in all different sectors in in lots of different ways. And you know, as an example of that, for a start, we said you know, we just want to be in property markets and we predominantly want to be in property credit. And, you know, in fact, if you go back to the very first business plan that I ever tabled for Qualitas, uh, which was in 2007, you know, I really made the comment there that we're going to do a series of individual transactions, prove up our track record before we actually launch funds, which is exactly what we did. And so I, I think we took it relatively slowly. I, I feel that, um, again, this was consistent with the very first business plan we ever put together at Qualitas. We actually said we want to build our back office, you know, our back and middle office, which is all our, as a fund manager, all our fiduciary management first before we go, you know, and really in earnest looking for high volumes of transactions. And I think if you ask someone in around 2010, you know, how do you think Andrew's going at Qualitas? Probably the response you would have got is he seems to have a lot of people there relative to what he's actually doing. And the, and the reason is because we were really busy building, you know, our, our fiduciary management side of the business, which is unusual to the extent that, um, you know, globally, a lot of people can go out and actually start just doing a lot of deals, and then they try and retrofit a back office afterwards. And we, we didn't want to go down, you know, that particular track. And, and I think for us, staying disciplined and relatively narrow allowed us to build the label of, you know, having a deep dive expertise in property which is what we re we wanted to be seen as those people, not the people that do corporate lending and we do infrastructure and, you know, we're, we're doing absolutely everything. If it makes a buck, we're the smartest guys and we're just going to go and do that. That was not what we were trying to do. What we were trying to do was say, think of us as a deep dive property investment house and we're looking for value-based opportunity and whether that value is coming through private credit or opportunistic, you know, that's, we've got the expertise to do that. And, and I think that came at the price of potentially doing things a little bit slower and in a more disciplined way. So it's, you know, I think it's an interesting observation you make. I actually don't think we grew anywhere near as fast as what we could have grown. You know, we never aspired to call ourselves the number one or you know, I don't, I don't believe bigger is better. Um, you know, I think for us, it was, you know, just stay in our lane and just whatever we do, let's do really well. And so that was the mantra we, we adopted straight, straight up front. It's, it's, um, I got to admit, it's kind of, it flies in the face of when I speak to some investors in on the property side of the ledger, uh, kind of flies in the face of that a little bit, uh, <laughs> which is a good thing. So, um, okay. So there are a few things that I think for our listeners sake, we need to cover which are which are on the kind of like let's be let's get you to be our field guide and explain how the industry works but before we get to that let's start with the, the first piece of the puzzle for you which is getting investors um to invest with you so we have lots of, of our listeners that are trying to solve this piece around income right we need they need income in their portfolio i think i was looking at our analytics today for some other part of our business. And I think the big reason that people follow us, I think it was about 20% of people respond by saying, I'm interested in income. You know, I, I need to get income in my life, whether it's in retirement, whether it's just part of their strategy, whether their financial advisor is looking for it, whatever the case. One of the things that people turn to uh, it, a real estate investment trust, REITs. I know you have a, have a listed fund, QRIs, the ASX ticker code but you also have unlisted funds. Why do investors come to you before going to say a REIT or something like that? Because I know you, I know you said that uh, bigger is not always better, but 
you know, multiple billions of dollars under management, you must be doing something right. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot in what you've just asked me. And yeah, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, it's good. So I'll start by saying, you know, to m- most of our capital is institutional and ultra, ultra high, high net worth capital that has traditionally invested with Qualitas. We we did see a gap in the market in 2018, particularly on, on the ASX, where we felt that there was no pure listed credit property credit fund on, on the ASX. And uh, with interest rates being, you know, they were already tracking well down At that point in time, I think base rates were 2% in 2018. You know, we really saw an opportunity to create a vehicle for more retail-based investors where they could take advantage of the income flows from private credit. And so if, if you go back to some of the earlier comments that I made, you know, one of the strongest benefits of private credit is that it pays interest on the loans on a, on a monthly basis. And we're able to pass those interest payments on to uh, the, the investors. And so we felt there was a gap in the market. We didn't understand why retail investors weren't being given an opportunity to take advantage of it. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't other listed credit funds on the ASX, but we, we had felt there was a role for a pure play property Fund, you know, bearing in mind my earlier comments about defining your area, staying in your lane, being deep dive on the things that you do. And so we wanted to bring that to the market. And so we launched uh, the Qualitas Real Estate Income Fund, which ticker code is QRI. And we really launched it for the purpose of having a few objectives. One was to pay monthly regular income. And The second one was to really have a strong focus on capital preservation because, you know, none of us, you know, absolutely know exactly what's around the corner. And there's always, you know, the systemic risks that build up in uh, in markets. And so we felt this was a way of having a strong level of capital preservation. And so we wanted to give that access to retail investors into into what we do. And so that's that's really the background to why we decided to launch QRI, you know, back in uh, 2018. I was reading one of the most recent fund letters and it looks like a lot of your investors in QRI actually reinvest in the fund. Um, I think the dividend investment reinvestment plan is active um, and it seems to be growing in terms of net assets more people wanting to invest and get exposure. Am, am I mistaken? Like, I, I think that's what I read. Yeah. Uh, you, no, I think you're right in that uh, we do have, I, I can't give you the exact percentage. I, I don't know it off the top of my head, but, you know, we do have a percentage of investors who have signed up to the uh, dividend reinvestment plan and, uh, you know, who are less about needing the cash, you know, month, month to month. Uh, but I, I think overall QRI has been a very attractive product in the market for a, num- a number of reasons. You know, the first one is that it pays monthly income. So, you know, the analogy would be, you know, for, for those of us on salary and wages, it hits your bank account in, in the middle of the month and, you know, it, people can have some, some level of expectation of, you know, that, uh, you know, that money coming in. And, and so, you know, the world, everyone in the world is searching for income. Interest rates are near zero that, you know, I, I know your listeners all know this, but the days of putting money on deposit and that being your investment strategy are long gone. And so you need to find strategies that, you know, produce its wealth preservation. So you feel, you know, you, you're going into something where, you know, someone's thinking about the downside and, and shielding against risk as much as possible. Everything has got risk, obviously, uh, and this is no different, but, you know, it has got shields and buffers 
against the risks on the downside and can outsurpass inflation expectations. And therefore, not only can you have some level of consumption of the income you earn, but you've also got an ability to you know, be doing better, exceeding inflation rates as well. And so you know, the current income levels of QRI is around the five and a half to 6% per annum. You know, it's one of the higher yielding LITs on the market. I guess, you know, that's why it's trading at a slight premium to um, its NTA because, you know, the uh, investors are seeing the income yield as being very attractive. And, and you know, I, I think that overall that's, you know, it's, it's the whole purpose behind QRI is it's, it's never going to be a stock that, you know, doubles or triples or quadruples in price. It's an, it's an income stock. So it's really about, you know, earning, uh, you know, a predictable level of income yield where you get a great return knowing that you've got capital preservation to the maximum extent possible on, on the downside, but really strong income levels that, uh, you know, you, you can build expectation around. I was going to ask this in a minute, but I think it's relevant to us now. How do, so I'm just looking at the fact sheet. I've actually got it here in front of me. Um, this is for July. And it was over 5%, as you say, the yield. Uh, how do most investors treat this, given, like you said, it's kind of in that lane and this is what you do. Just based, everyone's portfolio is different. Everyone gets advice and, and does all that separately. But do, are people treating this as, you know, in place of that bond exposure or that credit exposure, maybe like, you know, the traditional credit exposure? How do they, how are they thinking about positioning this in the portfolio? I, I think it's got a place with investors who like, you know, bank hybrids as, as an example, although obviously they're, you know, uh, lower yielding than what, what QRI is. And I think it would also appeal to investors who uh, are really looking for something that hand on heart, you can say, I understand this model. You know, if there's, if there's one thing we've really tried to achieve at QRI, it's simplicity. And, and I think you'd look at, and I'm not, I'm not, saying whether I think this is better or worse. It's not, you know, the angle I'm, you know, sort of making this next statement from. But I think there's a lot of credit LITs in Australia and globally where it can be less transparent or, you know, it's just more difficult to understand exactly, you know, what the underlying exposures are. And, and the real benefit, I think, of QRI, and, you know, I do you know, um, encourage anyone who's interested in investing in QRI to look at, you know, all of the materials that we've published and really get a good understanding, you know, of, of the stock. We've really tried to design something that's simple. It's basic, you know, it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's 32 loans that we've made to borrowers who we've got to, to know, we understand them, we understand the security. There's nothing complicated about it. We, you know, we haven't gone and taken uh, debt leverage within the fund to create some mathematical leveraged equation to produce a return to investors. You know, it's rel it's it's basically a straight pass through of 32 loans we've made to investors, and where we've given them a loan, we've taken predominantly a first mortgage position in respect of we've got a real asset mortgage on every single loan we've done you know we're holding personal guarantees um, from the vast majority of borrowers that you know we've given loans to who have said in return for that money i'm going to pay you an interest rate and in x period of time 18 months two years we're going to repay the loan and so i want to answer your question i, I really think it's for the investor that says, just give me something basic. I just, I'm looking for yield. I want something, I understand the downside risk of what I'm investing in. I'm looking to do significantly better than hybrids or bank deposit rates. And I want to be able to understand this story. I think it's going to appeal to that type of investor. 
Um, and certainly that's how we've tried to, you know, design the product so that it, it really does come with that type of simplicity. I noticed um, that there's investment loans, which are categorized there, there's land loans. And then if you look across the diversification, there's residential and commercial, and there's a little bit of industrial in there. This is where I'm hoping you can kind of be a field guide a bit. Can you explain basically the, the types of um, investors and the types of companies that come to you seeking finance and how you think about, you know, mitigating risk, doing your due, due diligence on them, understanding basically, even for us, understanding what is a first mortgage versus, you know, mezzanine and senior debt. Like what do all these terms mean just so people can understand exactly what is inside the portfolio? But foremost, the borrowers that we deal with are typically the same parties that would deal with banks. So it, it really goes to an earlier comment I made about, you know, the industry a, a decade ago and all the misunderstandings about the types of people that come to an alternative mm -hmm. lender. Um, maybe as one side point I would make on, you know, on, on, the, on the big picture of the question is that you know, many, many years ago, I think going to an alternative lender like Volatas was a nice to have for borrowers. You know, typically most of their banking was done through, you know, the four major Australian trading banks. And on the odd occasion, you, you would go to an alternative lender. I, I, I think it's a very different situation in 2021. I, I, I think these days borrowers don't say it's a nice to have relationship with a firm like Qualitas. I think they now say we're a must-have relationship. And the reason those borrowers come to Qualitas is because, you know, we we can show flexibility. You know, it goes back again to a comment I made earlier around how we fund ourselves. You know, we're, we're funding ourselves from equity capital derived from investors. You know, we're not, we're not a bank. We haven't levered our balance sheet you know, 10, 10 times using external money that we're then on lending to other parties. You know, we're dealing in an equity instrument and using those funds to provide loans to, to borrowers. So we can give very substantial levels of flexibility. Now, flexibility might mean, you know, we the loan sizing goes a little bit beyond, you know, what a traditional bank might do or, or perhaps it might mean you know we can take a focus on you know the types of assets themselves and the momentum of the asset in the marketplace you know we unlike a bank we don't have to have a strict uh you know ratio that we're we're abiding by because you know we're a deep dive property investment house and you know our analysis goes beyond ticking the box of evaluation or ticking the box of an interest cover ratio, if, if that's all we did, we'd be a bank earning, you know, one and a half percent type returns, which are obviously we're doing much more than that. So, you know, people come to us because of our flexibility and also just the timeliness of us being able to make a decision. You know, I think that, uh, you know, the banks will always have a huge place to play in the Australian market and they will always be exceedingly price competitive, but they do work in a narrow sandbox of what they will and won't do. And often, you know, just timeliness because they're busy and, you know, there's lots of processes and I'm not saying that in a negative way, just a factual way, you know, means that they can't quite, you know, make decisions at the same speed that a Qualitas can make because perhaps we're more nimble in how, how we go about our decision making. So I think for all those reasons, we attract, you know, very uh, strong borrowers. You know, for us, we don't accept everyone as a borrower. You know, we're looking for people who have track record uh, and, you know, can support loans in the event something was to go off the rails. And so, and, and a lot of borrowers know that, you know, our standards are relatively high. And as, and as a result of that, they want to deal with Qualitas because I think, you know, we we give them a stamp of credibility that, you know, is not is not that easy to get. So so it's important, I think listeners understand that, that we're, you know, we are dealing with a good set of borrowers. And 
uh, and often they are the same people that would be would be dealing with the banks but they do come to us because of the flexibility and and I think Owen in in part of your question was uh, you know land loans was it was a class of asset that you drew out now banks have typically found giving a developer um, a loan secured by infill development land very difficult because by its very nature, there's normally nothing on the land or it normally can't support an interest payment and which is very important for the banks. Whereas a group like ours can take a view that, you know, perhaps we provide a, you know, circa 50%, you know, loan to value uh, position against the land. Uh, we can take a view on the wider position of the borrower. And because, you know, we ourselves understand development, we, in other strategies, we do, you know, we, we do developments in our own right, you know, we're really able to assess the merits of that particular land. You know, banks, banks find that very difficult. But in return for that, you know, we, we're going to earn several hundred basis point premium over what the banks will earn. So we're getting paid to take those positions as well. And I think, uh, you know, our investors are really getting the benefit of our expertise on, you know, being able to appropriately allocate capital into those positions. Circling back to REITs and the, the key difference there, how do you how do you reconcile, I guess, the, when people are weighing up the two, what are the, some of the decisions people are thinking about and why they would choose QRI over you know, one of the many common REITs that we see on the ASX? Yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities between the REIT market and, and QRI. Probably the biggest uh, common factor is that, you know, both are really designed to produce uh, regular income for, for its investors. Look, looking at the differences, the main difference is the fact that the Q QRI isn't a model that's based upon buying an asset and in trying to improve the asset and looking for cap rate compression. And I know I've really simplified that statement, but you know, that's not what it's about. Whereas if you look at REITs, and I, again, I'm, I'm not you know, specifying or looking at any one in particular, but generalizing, you know, their model is much more about buying the physical underlying real estate looking to improve the real estate and hopefully through, you know, falling interest rate type environments, get some cap rate compression and really significantly improve the value of the asset and provide a total, a total return to the investors. And so, um, and that's fine. And it's, it's a well-worn path, obviously, you know, very uh, long list of investors who are seeking, you know, that type of exposure. But our differentiating point at QRI is that it's not a model that's based on cap rate compression or, or trying to necessarily fix an asset. It's really about us going in and providing a loan to a borrower at 65%, you know, max type levels against the value of the real estate on an agreed interest rate. So, you know, QRI typically has equity buffers and cushions for potential downside scenarios that can occur that unfortunately will first be felt by our borrowers through you know, their, their equity that sits in the underlying property before it affects our position. So we're not as directly exposed to market, market movements as what a REIT might be exposed to the underlying movement in the real estate. And, and I think that you, know, you, you have more of a headline return with certainty because in our in QRI world that that equals an agreed interest rate. So I think they're you know in general terms that's the point of differentiation. But the two points that are similar is uh, the return of income to investors. Yeah, because I, I noticed that the the weighted loan maturity, which is an interesting statistic, was around about one point three years at the end of July twenty twenty one. So. If you think about that, it's much shorter duration than some than owning the actual physical asset. If you're if you're a REIT owning that underlying and getting a much lesser yield, um, so that's kind of in, in I guess fixed income world that shorter duration is more of a cushion, as you say in general anyway, because the portfolio is revolving. Um, exactly. You, you know, yeah. uh, 
a lot, sorry, Owen, a lot, a lot of people ask me about that because they're quite surprised at the fact our maturity is only one, 1 1.3 years. And, uh, and the reason we do that is quite deliberate on our side because having shorter dated loans means that we can keep reassessing the asset that we've actually provided a loan against. And so it just keeps up front and center of our minds and, and you know, markets are moving all the time. So it basically provides a, a liquidity point for us to you know, keep that ongoing reassessment. And again, you know, I think if you look at duration of assets in REITs, as you correctly point out, they tend to be you know, much longer duration assets. Mm. So you mentioned something before about if there is, and, and I guess the thing that people always ask is, has, has the risk, you know, how is the risk profile as you talked at the very start of the, the show about balancing risk and reward. These are high, QRI is high yield. 5% in this market, in my opinion, sounds superb, but then you've got to balance that with risk. And you mentioned just before in one of your answers about, um, you know, the borrower is feeling the pinch first. And you also talk about things like mezzanine level, senior debt. Can you explain that kind of waterfall of, I guess, risk uh, versus reward for investors and where you try and sit in that? Yeah, so t- typically in a uh, what we call a capital stack mm-hmm. of uh, a property asset. So what's the composition of all of the money that sits in a property? And th- these are, this is really a generalisation, but, you know, it's, it's basically how, how it works, is up until the first 65% of the value of the asset is thought about as a senior, a senior loan. And typically, um, banks get to those sort of levels. They certainly did, uh, you know, in, in previous years. You know, the, these days, um, it, it might be a little bit less as to where the, the banks are able to, to get to. Um, but typically, the first 65% is thought about as a senior loan. The next part of capital is thought of as the mezzanine loan. You know, mezzanine meaning in between, the in-between money. It's the in-between the first mortgage and and the borrower equity in the transaction. And typically, depending on, you know, what the purpose of the loan is, you can find that mezzanine can sometimes go to 75 or 80% of the value of the loan. And typically, the last 20% is, is the borrower's capital. And so that's how people think about the capital stack. Now, each one of those layers of capital tends to earn, you know, different rates of return. As you can imagine, you know, the senior loans are the least risky position within, uh, within, within a capital asset and within the loan position. Uh, you know, typically they earn, uh, you know, mid single digit rates, rates of return. You can just see the return of QRI to get a sense of the types of rates of return that the senior lender will earn. Uh, mezzanine debt will be at a premium uh, to the senior debt. You know, sometimes that premium can be, you know, 300 to 500 basis points, three to 5% type premiums. And then you have the equity of the borrower sitting behind you again, depending on what the purpose of the loan might be or the asset might be, you'd expect the, you know, the equity owner to be earning somewhere between, you know, 15% and above type type levels on on their equity i mean that's quite you know a generalized uh estimate of of returns we you know in qri being a listed vehicle we don't we don't do a lot of mezzanine uh you know at the moment we're holding uh less than 10 percent of the total portfolio in mezzanine it can probably afford to grow a little bit from our conservative level where we are at the moment you know we tend to only deploy mezzanine capital on a very selective basis uh, where, you know, we've got a lot of confidence in, you know, the borrower, um, the nature of the loan and how we're going to get repaid on that particular loan. Um, but to answer your question, I, yeah, they're, they're the three levels of capital you typically find in a property transaction. How about in terms of then, so that, so the way I'm thinking about this is obviously, like you said, the first person to feel the pinch, you know, is further up. That's the the equity layer. That's the borrower themselves. How do you go about doing your 
your your own due diligence in terms of counterparty risk do they do these deals come to you your team assesses them um, maybe goes and visits the asset those types of things um, that's the kind of feel that I'm getting and then also look at the financials of whoever is is borrowing this money hugely is the answer you know it's you know I think I, for us it, it's back to you know deep dive understanding of the underlying property and the borrower that we're really dealing with and you know, for us, you know, valuations are an interesting document. Uh, and, you know, certainly we have a very close read of the valuation, but it's certainly not us saying, well, we got a $100 million valuation on this property. So therefore we're going to give a $65 million loan or a $60 million loan because the valuation, the VAL came in at a hundred mil. For us, it's really about understanding the basis of the valuation, not, not, not merely accepting the valuation. And so really understanding, you know, the experience and track record of the valuer themselves, who instructed the valuer, what were their instructions, what comparables did the valuer use in, in making, you know, their particular assessment, did the valuer, you know, fully understand the risks, opportunities and, and threats, disadvantages of the property when they determined uh, their valuation. So, you know, understanding that the built form structural integrity of, of, you know, the property itself are all factors that, you know, we, we deeply take into account. And then also understanding the borrower. So what their track record is, credit history, uh, their ability to put more equity into the specific loan position should it need, should it need more equity are really important to us. And, and I think that's a differentiating point that, you know, again, it's very important to understand because you know, there's lots of groups globally who talk about, you know, providing first mortgages, but it's not a commodity, you know, not, not all first mortgages equal first mortgages. And by that, you know, a lot of people say, well, I've got a great property, so I'm happy to give a first mortgage. And the fact that I've got a secondary or tertiary borrower doesn't really matter because I've got a cracker of a property <laughs> and you know, worst case is I can own the property. Well, you know, in Australia, you can't, we don't have rules of foreclosure. So you can't easily just go and take ownership of a property as a lender uh, because our legal system doesn't allow that to occur. But, but secondly, you know, what's important for us is we, we don't want to find ourselves in a position where we're having to enforce mm -hmm. on our security as a means to exit. We really see that as a worst case scenario, a necessary case, if we find ourselves there and if we have to act on it and do something, but we don't want to end up there. And, uh, and so we really look for borrowers who can support their position so that you know, we, we don't have to end up there. Now, again, as I was saying, I, I don't think people often um, you know, think about it in those terms, certainly outside of Australia, you know, there are groups who, are in what's called a loan to own business, which is just giving people um, loans, you know, that they know they can recover through their security and it'll be whatever it's gonna be, but that's not the view that Qualitas takes. And I think it goes to how one thinks about governance and, you know, ESG and, you know, just how you wanna conduct yourselves. You know, we just wanna give people a, um, an honest loan on transparent terms and conditions and just get repaid in the ordinary course. And for us, that's absolute success and, you know, how we really think about it. How is, um, speaking, this is probably the last question I'll have around uh, risks necessarily, but just, I guess the elephant in the room, and I know you've answered this before in previous interviews, is, is COVID, right? COVID changing the landscape. Uh, how, how, have you, how are you seeing that shake out in terms of, maybe just, you can answer it specifically for the QRI, vehicle or maybe all of the, the funds in the Qualitas business. But how are you seeing COVID change the landscape for investors in this asset class? So, so COVID's an event that, you know, not, none of us thankfully have experienced previously. So you can't really draw on, you know, previous cycles to un understand, you know, what, what occurred and, and what we can interpret from it. But I, the way I think about it is it, it, it goes back to an earlier comment we, we discussed, which is, 
you know, the value of a property is really a function of the discount rate you apply to its future cash flows. And, and that discount rate is really a rate based on time, value and risk. So I think of COVID in terms of on an asset by asset basis, how is COVID going to impact the future cash flows of this particular property that we may be looking at? And so for an example, if I'm looking at a, um, a building that's used as a restaurant or you know, we're looking at a student accommodation or we're looking at hotels, then I think it's fair for us to assume it will be COVID impacted. And unless there's a very strong tenant with a very strong covenant promise, covenant behind that tenant in respect of the payment of rent, then we should expect the cash flows to be disrupted and therefore applying a discount rate to disrupted cash flows would mean there's downside value on the property. On, on the other hand, you may have an industrial property that's leased to one of Australia's largest ASX listed entities who, uh, you know, with a 15 year high growth lease that you may say COVID will have, you know, zero impact on the value of this cash flow. And in fact, in a COVID environment with interest rates, you know, staying very low, if not potentially further reducing, you know, I could expect the value of this property to go up because there'll be more capital chasing, you know, this, this particular property. So I think you've got to go revenue line by revenue line on property and say, to, to what extent do I think um, COVID will have an impact on it? That's the theory. I think that the practice is that, you know, there's so much capital currently in the market. You know, we are working, as I said earlier, about, you know, just how highly liquid these markets are at the present point of time. That what I'm finding is more traditionally, investors would have seen this as a, an era of some level of distress where you'd be finding assets that are um, impacted by COVID, therefore they've become situational, potentially somewhat distressed, and you'd be starting to find, you know, there's distressed type investors looking to acquire. But I think because there's so much liquidity in the system at the moment, what's really happening is the smarter investors are saying, look, I'm not necessarily looking for distress. What I'm looking to do is buy iconic assets that potentially might be hard to acquire in more normal markets, but because they're owned by parties who might be COVID impacted, it gives me an opportunity to buy those assets, albeit I'm still buying it based on pre-COVID valuations. So I think what COVID's doing in practice is just unlocking the ability for investors to purchase assets that are otherwise difficult to purchase. And we're not really seeing any distress come through the, the markets. And in fact, probably to my surprise, I would say, as, as far as Qualitas can see, that by and large, as a group, we're, we're really not seeing a lot of distress come through. Which is, I guess, you know, as someone that's not as, even as intimate as, as you, like nearly as intimate as you are with the market, you would think that the changing landscape, you know, the hybrid working environments, those types of things might impact it. But if you're at the, maybe at the, the, the quality end of that spectrum and you've, you've got regular recurring borrowers and, and the like, you can have that, you know, assurance too, um, that your, your underlying is, is very stable. Um, there is, I think I've got, I think I've got a couple more questions for you, but the, the, the this is a quick one, which was this idea, um, and I'm not sure if this applies to QRI, but this idea, which you've spoken about before of build to rent, which I think is more popular overseas than it is here in Australia, um, from a financier's perspective, can you just, ex maybe is your elevator pitch for that? Like what, what, is it as simple as it sounds, build to rent as a new financing that? Yeah, I, I think it is as simple as it sounds. And you know, in overseas markets, people really refer to it as multifamily. Built to rent is more an Australian specific term. And what it involves, I mean, you know, as, as most people would know, in, in Australia, we've really built high density residential apartments off the back of a developer who, uh, you know, goes and gets a 
uh, detailed design for a building, you know, looks to get a development approval or planning permit, then undertakes a strata sell down on a unit by unit basis, predominantly to private investors who commit to buying, they put a 10% deposit down on, a, on an apartment. A large construction company typically builds the apartment and then on completion, the 90% of the balance gets paid. And it's been a great model for Australia. Uh, defaults have been exceedingly low and it has supplied a lot of accommodation, residential accommodation into, into the Australian market. But it does rely on individual purchases and it also relies upon some level of off the plan sales occurring in the market prior to the commencement of construction. And so I, I think what's happened is uh, institutional capital has been looking at this model and saying, you know, we enjoy owning industrial assets, retail assets and office assets. There's no reason why we can't own entire buildings that are specifically built for residential. And those institutional investors don't need to undertake pre-sales to satisfy bank lending criteria. You know, they're, they're happy to have, you know, lower amounts of gearing, uh, leverage or, or no leverage in their, you know, in their projects in order to make them successful. And they really see the opportunity of therefore building entire buildings, they own them outright, and you know they enjoy the long-term benefits of, of rental. The one, the one point of difference between build to rent versus more standard investor type uh, build, as, as they call it, build to sell apartments, is a build to rent is really catering to the tenant. You know, accepting that you know there's a proportion of Australian society who are very happy to be renters, no, no different to mm. say in the United States, because you know, generally they tend to be uh, you know, people who are earlier in their careers, they don't want commitment, they want to be more mobile, they don't want to put their life savings into a mortgage because they're more interested in exploring entrepreneurial ideas for creating wealth and you know, they view owning you know, property and paying off a 30 year mortgage is something that my era did, you know, not, not necessarily something that, um, you know, that, that people at the start of their careers want to do, do or want to do. And so what, what it really does is create buildings that is an incredible lifestyle for that group of people that, you know, it's not so much about just going to your apartment and shutting the door and not mixing with anyone in the building. You know, these buildings really have a lot of public amenity to try and get the community together as a group, get people out of their living quarters apartments, which are beautiful, but get them into, you know, the pools and the barbecues and the, you know, the, the community kitchens and libraries and aerobics rooms, you know, the things that really get people to intermingle and, and really look at getting, you know, levels of rent that would otherwise be hard to get if you're just buying a stock standard, sorry, you're just renting a stock standard apartment in an investor driven, you know, product somewhere. So we're, it's a nascent industry. I think it's incredibly exciting and we'll have a very long future. I do think you look back in a decade's time and institutions owning single buildings who have, you know, multiple tenants purely, you know, for build to rent purposes is going to be a very well accepted asset class. And we, it's just so exciting. We're at the start of that process now. Mm, it is indeed. And it makes sense from an outsider's perspective. It makes sense. So the one final question I've got for you, which is, um, which is really simple, is just how can people find out more about what you're doing with Qualitas, but specifically also with the QRI fund? Is there documentation or webinars or something that's available to help people understand the opportunity there, and especially focused on people that are thinking about income? So the easiest way to learn about us is uh, as, as a listed stock, you know, we have a lot of presentation type materials that, uh, you know, we've, we've announced on the ASX. So uh, that, that's one good way to access significant mm -hmm. information about QRI. Um, also, you know, going to the Qualitas website, 
Qualitas, qualitas.com.au is also a really good way to access information. Um, for anyone who's a wholesale investor um, and would satisfy those requirements uh, to call, um, our officers speak to a private client advisor is, is a great way to um, you know, access uh, Qualitas related uh, funds. But, but I think for most people, you know, I'd, I'd really encourage having a really good look at QRI. You know, it's, you know, it's a vehicle that you know, brings all the benefits of uh, mm -hmm. liquidity that you get from being an ASX listed stock with all the, you know, the benefits of private credit that we've really spoken about today. So I, I think it really is just a matter of um, you know, speaking to your, whether it's a wealth advisor, your, um, you know, a broker, uh, you know, including uh, on, online access to, to really gain information. We've, we've put a lot out there in regards to QRI. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, you know, we've got a specific um, IR team, investor relations team that focuses on QRI. I'm sure at any time they'd be happy to take calls from, you know, interested people who may want to understand it a little bit more than what I've explained today. But yeah, we'd, we'd really welcome that. Great. Yeah, I'll put all the, the links to all of those resources in the show notes. And um, I think you did a great job of explaining it for what it's worth, mate. So I really appreciate <laughs> you taking the time to, to join me on the show today. Great. Thank you. I really, I really enjoyed it. And thanks very much for having me.